Welcome to yet another science podcast, a podcast devoted to conversations with scholars containing philosophical, historical, motivational, conceptual, and technical questions relating to their research. In this episode, we interview Moshe Vardy, a university professor of computational engineering at Rice University. He is the recipient of numerous awards, including three IBM Outstanding Innovation Awards and the ACMS IGACD Godel Prize. He is the author and co-author of over 700 papers, as well as two books. He is a fellow of numerous organizations, such as the American Association for the Advancement of Science, the American Mathematical Society, the Association for the Advancement of Artificial Intelligence, and the Association for Computing Machinery. He holds seven honorary doctorates, and he is currently a senior editor of the communications of the ACM, after having served for a decade as editor-in-chief. Enjoy. So I often get asked, what do I do? And I've been studying computer science in university for a while, and I often tell people I'm studying computer science. And their first reaction is, oh, you're a computer programmer. You want to become a computer programmer. And I don't really know how to respond. Sometimes I just nod my head and say yes. But I'm always very dissatisfied when I give this answer. And the reason for this is I feel like computer science is much deeper. It's, but there's, a, there's a bigger beauty to it. And I always think of this quote from Dijkstra. Computer science is no more about computers than astronomy is about the telescope. So my question is, what is computer science? So some years ago, a couple of professors at Rice in the School of Humanities invited my wife and uh, myself for dinner. And uh, the husband asked me, can you explain to me what is, it that you, what is it you do? And I said, fundamental theoretical study on what computers can or cannot do. And my wife was very excited. She says, oh, for the first time, I have some understanding what is it that you do? How come you never told me that before? <laughs> so, first of all, I think Dijkstra objected to the term computer science. He did not like the term computer science. That was the oh. quote, was an objection to the American, to the North American term computer science. And in fact, if you look at uh, Europe, the term usually uses informatics, not, not computer science, it uses informatics. So. I think there is something fundamental that we are kind of missing. And that fundamental thing is what is, what is computing about? And I think this is something that, that we are missing how revolutionary it is. And what I mean, it's, it's revolutionary. So take the concept of uh, information. It's a very fuzzy concept, information. What is information? So if you look at kind of a historical de development, Somewhere, some hundred thousand years ago, other animals are using sound to convey information. So we did not invent this. Okay, I mean they have different type of sound to convey different type of information. <laughs> but we took it to the next level with invention of language. Okay, I mean if you pick, people keep talking, what distinguish human beings from animals? What is the, the step function, so to speak? I mean. And probably uh, language is, is one of these step functions. The ability to construct sentences and paragraphs and chapters and, and just longer and longer, not just ability to convey information, but to, to raise it to more and more complex level of information. Then somewhere around 6,000 years ago, we invented writing. So now we have a way to take this fuzzy thing of information and we can at least store it. This was the first, you know, this, this uh, clay tablets were the first uh, systematic way of storing information. And after that, we had, we had developed it. We had other de develop, development, which is the print, which is able to replicate it. But what happened in the, starting in the 19th century, but then in the 20th century, ability to process information. So an older term to computer science that you don't hear much these days was, uh, is information processing. In fact, one of the, all this professional association, which is supposed to be international, but mostly European, is called IFIP, not very active these days, but it's formation in International Federation for Information Processing. And people kind of drop using it because it sounds like what, you know, banks and insurance companies to do information processing. So, so today it has a bit of a stale, a stale flavor to it, so we don't use it much. But actually I think 
there's, there's nothing, no reason to be stale about it. We're in the business of processing information. And this is what, what is so revolutionary to me about this field. We took something that people say, well, information, it's like love, affection. You know, what is it? This, uh, this fuzzy, fuzzy concept. And step by step, we made it, no, this is something concrete. And, you know, information theory and information processing. This is an astounding, astounding revolution. That's the business I think we're in. We're in business of processing information. You know, you, you mentioned it's, it's, it's a fuzzy word, information, right? But what, what really is information? Is it just, can you be a bit more so concrete about I, it? You know, we, you know, there is a famous uh, quote to one of the uh, Supreme Court justices of the United States about, uh, about pornography. And he said, I cannot define it, but I know it when I see it. So I think, again, information is, it, it is a fuzzy concept, but the, the fact that we can say, okay, let's take this interview. Well, at the heart of it, what we are doing here, but we are transmitting, we are digitizing sound and we are digitiz digitizing images. Now we have taken sound and images. These are the thing how we, the, the, we experience the, the world. We're saying it's just information. It's just a stream of beats. And once we have a stream of beats, now we can process it. And, uh, you know, you can have, uh, you can look at the sound and uh, you can do all kind of transformation on the sound and on the images. So we've taken things that we didn't think of, well, I'm, I'm, we, are, we are in the information policy business all the time because we, the way we manipulate ourselves in the world, we convey information, we talk, we listen, we see, we react. So, but we say this can all be reduced to beats. So this digitization, the fact that we can say at the end of the day, it's just about a stream of bits. And we can do all kind of magical thing once we have this stream of bits. So what is it about the bit, right? It's, it's such a precise, uh, it's a zero or a one that we can encode so much with. Right? So I guess it, it lays at the heart of yes, all Yes, it does, it does. But um, again, somewhere, somewhere, you know, we develop, don't know exactly the full history of it, but I think the, the positional number system was developed in India or in the Arabs, the Indian, I don't, I'm not quite an expert on this precise history of this, but just compare doing multiplication with the, in the positional system versus try to do multiplication if you're using Roman, Roman numbers, try to multiply, you know, uh, 601 times 599 in Roman numbers. I have no idea how they did it. You have, you have, <laughs> it sounds like a Google, a Google code. Yeah, yeah, you, have, you have to how appreciate the, how the, the Roman, Roman engineering They've done amazing, actually, a fair amount of engineering, building bridges, building large buildings, and then it's all using Roman numbers. So how did they do it? Who knows? <laughs> but once we have the positional system, and then I think it was due to Leibniz who says, hmm, we're using decimal system, but that's because we have 10 digits. In fact, the term digit comes from the digits we have on our fingers. Okay, we have 10 digits on our, on our hands, so, so that's why you use decimal system. The Babylonian used 60. I'm not quite sure how they came up with 60. But he said the essence of it is really just a binary system. And the beautiful of binary, and that's part of the connection to logic, is that once it's zero and one, and then it is false and true. So you see, we're already in logic. As soon as we, we, we say the essence of it is a binary system, <laughs> we are re realizing that, that this tight connection between logic and numbers. And in fact, you know, if you look how computing come, come about, you know, it, computing is, is mechanical computing even proceeds. I talked about it in the 20th century, but people have been using Abakai for uh, probably, uh, you know, at least 2000 years. Okay. And uh, this cause, you know, this was mechanical aid. And so the idea of mechani mechanizing at least computing is in some shape or form, then people start building mechanical calculators. Leibniz built mechanical calculators. And then Leibniz came up with this idea, what we call calculus ratiocinator, the reasoning calculus. And he says, if we can mechanically compute with numbers, we should be able now to do information processing. Okay, so he said we can, and we can capture knowledge in some formal language, and then we can process it. You know, there is... There is a chain of ideas. You can go back and I've given talk of it, how we go step by step. But when you look at the end of it, you have Leibniz come up with this, with this dream of, of reasoning, reasoning calculus, reasoning cal calculators. And eventually in 20th century, it's becoming a reality. So this is an astounding revolution whose, 
whose impact is yet fully to be seen. I mean, there is a, I like to tell this anecdote about a physicist in early 20th century UK, I think it was in Cambridge, in the Cavendish, Cavendish lab, they, they discovered the electron. It was a great uh, scientific discovery. They had a cocktail party to celebrate it, and they made a toast to the electron, which will never be of any use to anyone. So they were so proud. This is pure science of no use whatsoever. How could ever anybody ever hope to use the electrons? So we are kind of the same situation. Inventors don't, don't know what they are, they are really doing. They don't have necessarily the thing, what will happen with their invention in 100 years? Will it disappear? Will it change the world? In this case, a sequence of steps. There were some people who said this is going to change the world in, in a profound way. Von Neumann was very, very, very well aware. I said this will change the future provided there is a future. He thought that, that computing was, he was involved in development of the, of the atom bomb in World War II. And, uh, and he thought that computing is a much bigger deal than the nuclear bomb. Changing gears a little bit. Um, you know, we talk about these mechanical machines, right? Like the mechanical arithmetic. And maybe if you, if you show a mechanical machine to a current undergrad, they might get, they, they get bored really fast. There's, there's no hype. To it. At least at, at the time, it didn't seem like there was a lot of hype. Nowadays, computers are so flashy. People are saying artificial general intelligence by the end of the decade, or the, you know, we have crazy new technologies. But when you came up into this, there wasn't so much hype. And if I checked your Wikipedia, I think you went through undergrad at a similar time that my mother went through undergrad. And she often talked, she took one programming class in undergrad. It was in Fortran. And it was on the punch cards and she would submit them to a mainframe. She'd have to be very careful about her cards. A lot of the same syntactic issues you might see in a computer today, but it doesn't, there's no, it's not as sexy as it is now. Right. How, how did you find this problem, computer science in such a hype what's time? I actually, I don't know. Okay. I was young. I was naive. Somehow this <laughs> attracted me. But if you ask me today, so what was the attraction? answer is, I really don't know. I was 16 years old. I just got intrigued by this. I said, okay, let's, let's pursue it. But I had no, I had no vision. This is going to change the world. This is going to go to AGI, you know, all of this, all of these things came later. Why? And you have to understand at this, at this time that when I read about computers, it was, I have not even read, I have up to the point, I have not even read much science fiction. I started reading science, science fiction. A little later, it's when I was in when I was in college. I was in the library looking for something, and I saw I saw the spine of a book says "I Robot." I said, "What is this?" Mm. And I pull it out, and I stood there and finished the book standing in the stacks. Okay, it was I discovered science fiction. So before that, I didn't even in, read any 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 science fiction. So I, you know, Asimov talks about computers, and uh, but I have not been exposed to that. So what was, why this 16 year old boy got intrigued by computers? Let's go study programming. I, today I can go and I said, what was it? It just intrigued me. I said, this sounds interesting. I want to study it. It's a new thing. Let's study it. And I took, took the same thing, Fortran, punch cards, very boring programs, relatively speaking, because it, two weeks, you know, and, and the cycle, you have to understand the cycle was you write your program on a coding sheet. There was these sheets with a, uh, every row was 80, 80, 80 cells. So you had to write inside the cells. You get the, ne the next day and you discover the, the punch, the key punch operator made some, some mistake typing. So you correct them. And it takes you two, three days to finish. This was all women that they, they, that she typed it right. And then you start to discover that you made mistake in writing it. And then you discover the logical error of this. But it was a colossal hassle, but there was something, there was some, I would say some cold beauty in it, that here is a kind of a logical taskmaster and it makes no mistakes. All the mistakes are yours, okay? You just have to get it right. I mean, at the beginning, you say, oh, the, the compiler must be wrong. And after a while you realize, no, Compiler, even though, of course, the, you could have in principle compiler errors, but unlikely. So one of the early lessons when you start studying programming, 
you own your mistakes. That's a very, very powerful lesson. Okay, there's no one else to blame. You can look around. Who else did that? It's just you. He just the code logic of programming. And I said the, the, the precision of it and the fact that it's in the rule, you know the rule perfectly clear. Okay. So it just now, you know, you just have to follow the rules and come up with the right solutions. But the rules are clear. You know exactly what the rules are. There's no mystery here. And at A16, for A16 boy, for example, many aspects of life were a mystery. In particular, girls were a total mystery. Okay. I couldn't figure out, still cannot figure them out. Yeah. But, but, uh, <laughs> but computers, you can figure out, okay? I mean, there is something, something there is a quote that I use in one of the talks about, uh, due to Hilbert, when you look at mathematical problem, if you don't solve it, today we know about incompleteness. So we can always say, if you're looking at a very, very difficult problem, you can say, well, maybe it is not provable by piano arithmetic, by from set theory, but, but Hilbert didn't have it. He thought, it was just a matter of thinking hard enough, okay? Well, if I give you a mathematical problem and you cannot solve it, you don't think, oh, it must be incompleteness. You think, I'm not smart enough. I didn't think about hard enough. I don't have the right idea. I'll keep working on it. That's how you think about it. So the answer is, it's just, it just an intellectual challenge, pure intellectual challenge. And that's the core beauty of pure intellectual challenge captivated me. Do you, do you ever feel like the newer scholars of computer science are a little bit spoiled? compared to what you had to go through. There, 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 there must be just so many quality of life things mm -hmm. that we just take for granted now that we're just, the, I, I'm, a, I'm completely oblivious to that. Sure. Every generation feels that the current gen, the, the new generation is spoiled. Okay, this is the nature. I mean, I, you think, oh, he grew up in such a difficult time. Today we have it so much easier. My parents probably looked at me and given my parents lived through World War II. So my parents uh, are both Holocaust survivors. So. Whatever I went through is nothing compared to other generations. So this is the nature of life, okay? The nature yeah. is every generation has its challenges. The challenges are different. But, you know, I mean, think of today. We have, uh, we're talking about the mental health crisis, especially among teens. And there are some very disturbing numbers about suicide is rising among, among, I mean, I saw the one statistic that just really I found heartbreaking is ages 10 to 14, Really, kids, not barely teenagers, okay? Teen teenagers. And between, I think, 2007 and 2017, suicide rate tripled. And this is just heartbreaking to think about it. And uh, so they have their own challenges in a way that different challenges. So I, I don't know that we had it easier or harder. I think the challenges change from generation to generation. Every generation thinks they had it hard. You know, I used to tell when my son had to go to walk to school, I said, well, you know, I had to walk a fair distance to school. You know, it's no big deal if you had to. He had to walk to school about a, 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 about a mile. Um, yeah, maybe a mile. Anyway, I made a big deal about how much I had to, to go to school too, to walk to school too. <laughs> and then so, said, like, you walk 10 miles up the hill to go to school, and then you walk 10 miles up the hill again to go yeah, home, right? And then, but then, then, then some joke. years later, I, I took uh, uh, my wife and to visit in Israel, and, and we went to visit the place where I grew up. And I show, I said, let me show you the walk to school. It was not half a mile. It was maybe one quarter of a mile. It was so short. I was surprised. I was a little kid. It looked like a, lo a long distance to me, but it was actually, my son had to walk longer to go to school than I had to walk to school. So very often the, the difficulty is in your mind. So you, you said you found computer science when you were around 16, you went to undergrad. But you did end up going through the PhD process. So you must have, something must have really stuck with you. Were, were there any particular scholars at the time who really inspired you to really make you want to pursue a career in research? So my determination to become a scientist actually even preceded, preceded college. I think maybe age, maybe age 13. For, think for my bar mitzvah, I revealed a sequence oh. of 10 volumes called The Young Engineers. And I read these books. I mean, it was 10 volumes. I read them. It was, I spent a lot of time reading, going through 10 volumes. And these 10 volumes were um, just trying to kind of read a little bit about science, but that was enough for me to say, I want to become a scientist. And when I finished high school, I come from a family with long rabbinical traditions. My father was a rabbi. 
Oh, his see. father was a rabbi. Who knows? I don't know much belonging, but it's come from a long rabbinical tradition. And so it was natural. My father thought that uh, I'm not the oldest. In, I'm, I'm, I'm the second child, but I was the first male. I should continue in his path and become a rabbi. But I was interested in science. And at the beginning, I thought it was going to be physics because I loved physics in high school. So I said, in effect, my major in, when I went to college, I majored in, in, uh, in physics. But as I said, I dis also discovered uh, computer science, programming. Really, I can't say I discovered computer science, I discovered programming. And so I had a, a major in physics and a minor in computer science. And then I had to decide when it's time to go to graduate school, what do I go? What do I go? Do I continue with physics or do I, do I continue with computer science? And that's when I made the decision. Yeah, I think computers is the way, if the wave of the future. So kind of the decision to go into to graduate school, that's really when I kind of made the decision. I'm going to become a computer scientist. Thanks for listening. If you are enjoying the episode and would like to support this as an educational resource, please consider giving us a like, subscribe, comment, or review on whichever platform you are consuming the show. We are just getting started and a little goes a long way in helping us cover costs. So we have, we have logic and we have computation and there, there's this really close relationship to them. What is this relationship? I mean, the interesting thing is that if you, today I, I speak a lot and you must have seen some of my, my talks on logic computation, but this, this thing took yeah. years to crystallize in my mind. I gave in on, a, on January 14, 2021. It was the first time that we celebrated the World Logic Day. So at some point, UNESCO has declared January 14 to be World Logic Day because it's a day that I think Gedel died and Tarski was born or the other way around. I'm not quite sure which, which, but it's rela generally fully related to two of the major foremost logicians of the 20th, 20th century. So UNESCO declared World Logic Day and people have done kind of so some promotion to try to encourage people to do many local events. And I said, okay, I'll give a talk. But remember, this was January 21. So in fact, probably I just got my first vaccine. So no one at the time thought about having an in-person lecture. So I said, okay, we'll do a virtual lecture. And uh, I asked uh, the PR person in computer science here to do some publicity and send her the abstract. She read the abstract and the abstract is kind of very general, kind of broad audience. And she said, this for a broad audience? I said, yeah. So she said, so I'm going to go all out with publicity for this. No, this is not just for our local community. And she did an, an amazing job of publicity for this. And about, uh, about a thousand people attended this talk, which I claim probably is the, is the largest audience of any logic talk in the history of the, of the cosmos. <laughs> so, or at least the history of this planet, I don't know about some other, other uh, galaxies. And a friend of mine, who's not a computer scientist, watched the talk and he liked it very much. And he asked me after that, there was an amazingly well done talk. How long did it take to prepare it? And I said, 20 years. Because I've been working on it now for, you know, it changes and I kind of polishing it and change and discover new things. But partly the connection is really, the connection between logic and, and, and computation was there from early days. It's somehow not the way we, we are taught, okay? And very often the way we are taught is that the early discipline is we go back to, to Babbage, for example, okay, and it's just about computing. But Babbage is this idea of the analytical engine, the difference engine. It just, we just okay. celebrated the 200th anniversary of the difference engine. He wanted to build the analytical engine. But these ideas that I said, you, you go back to Leibniz, who talk about the reasoning calculus, and he talks specifically about really reasoning and calculus. He, put, he puts them together. Calculus ratiocinator, and then you see people, you know, Bull did not talk much about computation, but people after that, people like uh, uh, Givons and Babbage definitely thought that if you can do logic, they realize if you can do logic, and in particular, you can do zero one, you can do bits, you can do computation. So you can find quotes about the connection between logic and computation, which are quite amazing, and they are 19th century computation. And people are already in the 19th century before they built anything. They already are asking questions about artificial intelligence in some sense. Is there a, what's the difference between reasoning done by a machine and reasoning die, reason done by, by the brain? So this question already arose in the 19th century. So this connection was, was kind of brewing up. But, you know, you look at many things and there's no, it's nice to show 
kind of in, 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 in the talk, when I give the talk, I, do, I show this nice narrative. But of course, in things, how one thing leads to the next thing. Things don't behave like that in the real world, right? There are multiple factors and there was a, there are many drivers. And one of the drivers was the, the foundational crisis in mathematics. Okay, so we're starting now with something that has nothing to do with computer on the face of it, okay? So first of all, the history of mathematical computing is they got together from the very, very beginning because people needed to compute. If, if you and I went gathering and we gather, you know, 16, 16 uh, um, tubers, we have to divide it between us. So you can say, okay, one for you, one for me, one for you, one for me, okay? But gradually the computational tasks become more, more complicated. When you started farming, then it was become even more complicated. You have to take a field and divide it equal, field that was not necessarily nicely rectangular. You have to divide it equally between the three, the three boys that inherit the field. So all kind of computational tasks arose. And out of this came, people started doing arithmetics and, and geometry. It all came from actually from applied task. So it started from the need to compute. This was the theory, really, re initially arithmetics and, and geometry came from, in some sense, the, the theory of computing of, of where, you know, go back, we're talking about uh, Euclid, Euclid in, uh, I think, 4th century BC. And the element. The right? element. Yeah. So it was, at the beginning, it started from the need to compute. But then they discover what mathematicians had discovered, that once you create these abstractions, they have this independent power. And you, you, today we can go and we start the number theory. We do this obvious abstraction, and you have amazingly deep phenomena you discover just on this, this abstraction. People discover that prime numbers and then deep theory that un underlines this. But it started from the need to compute, okay? And, but then mathematics kind of, and mathematics, you know, keep developing, part of mathematics always the need to compute and to solve more complicated computational tasks. But then you have in the, in the 19th century, late in the 19th century, heading into the 20th century, what became known as the foundational crisis. People discover that they are, when you, when you deal with even with calculus, you're really dealing with the infinite. You, look at, you go to limits, infinite large, infinite small. So you're really dealing with the infinite. In the infinite was this very fuzzy, another fuzzy and dangerous concept that mathematician and philosopher debated, does infinite exist? Okay. I remember once an argument I had with my brother-in-law who was a lay person. No, 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 there's no infinite. Nothing is infinite. And, but this is all debate. Ar Aristotle said there is no infinite. You can keep counting numbers, but there's no infinite. But other people say, what do you mean? God can see all the numbers. So there are infinite many numbers. But this, again, fuzzy philosophical debate becomes a foundational crisis when Russell come up with the Russell's paradox in the early 20th century, 1902. And suddenly the basic language of mathematics seems to be problematic. So now we ask, what is the proof? So the argument always for mathematics, what mathematic mathematics is very, very special. It is something that no other discipline has. The evidence that you bring for mathematical assertion is a form of a proof. It's an airtight argument. Once you have a proof, there's nothing to debate. Other things, you know, even you have experimental things, you say we have experiment, how accurate are the experiment, are the other interpretations. Mathematics seem to have a proof, which people call it the high road to truth. But then people are saying, wait a minute, what is a proof? What is a rigorous proof? We have a concept of a proof, but can we be precise about what is a proof? And the conclusion was, a proof has to be so precise, has to be machine checkable. There's no room for creativity or imagination when you check a proof. It has to be just, just airtight, okay? So it has to be airtight, so a proof has to, a, a, a correct proof has to be so rigorous, it has to be machine checkable. So now we're saying, what is a proof? We bring computation back into this to explain what is mathematics, what is the concept of computability. So when you look at computability theory, which you can say is a big part of the foundation, theoretical computer science, is go back to, you know, Turing and Turing with Turing machines and Church with a, with recursive function. So about try to answer the question that goes back when when uh, Gedel formalized, start formalizing or disprove in terms of computability. So now we, we kind of circle back and we say, wait a minute, if we want to do logic, we need computers because only computers, only me mechanics, people think about computers, but it, uh, machines should check that you made no, uh, you know, the, the, the logic has to be airtight and it has to be so airtight, machines have to check it. You cannot be left to the human mind because humans can make mistakes. So we are back now 
try to lay foundation for mathematics. And we said to lay foundation for mathematics, now we need, com- we need computing. Now, at the time, it was more of an abstract desire. Okay? I mean, it kind of not. They didn't really build computers to check proofs, but it was just as a, this is a def- was a definitional thing. What is a proof? An object can be checked by a computer. But now, this was now we're talking about maybe the early 20th century. And I'll skip about uh, maybe 80 years, and mathematicians are encountering proofs of such complexity that they cannot trust themselves to check it. So one of the first cases was the, the four color theorems that end up with this such complicated case analysis. You know, it's okay to do case analysis and to say, okay, there are five cases to consider. Let's go one by one by one. Okay. But what happens if there are uh, 1,500 cases to consider? Are we, can we exhaustively check all of them? Can we be sure we didn't miss anyone? And so the four color theorem, people said, okay, let's, let's have a program. Let's write a program to generate all the cases and check all the cases. And people say, yeah, but maybe, maybe the program will, will has error in it. So can we fully trust it? And so we're gradually coming now to the emergence of computer-aided proofs. But we said, well, only we are really going to be sure of these proofs is if it is a, a mechanically checked proof. So this was really this idea that the proof has to be so rigorous that the machine can be checked, it, which was purely an abstract idea in the 19th century, is now suddenly becoming part of, I wouldn't say standard mathematical practice. I mean, I, I wouldn't go to say that. Most mathematicians are still using the, the pen and paper, the, the whiteboard, the blackboard method. Uh, how do I make sure that it's, the proof is correct? I convince my colleague that it's correct. But in some, in some special cases of theorem of such, or proof of such complexity that people do not think that the human brain can fully encompass it, we're going back to the ideas of, of uh, Gedel and, and, and Turing and Church about, no, we need to formalize it. It has to be machine checkable. So this, this connection between logic and computer, in some sense, it's kind of was always there. The only question at what level of explicitness. It's interesting how precise mathematics has to be, but it also relates to what you were saying earlier about like how you fell in love with computers, right? Like the preciseness of it's the computer preciseness. Itself, right? It's the preciseness. Yeah. I mean, the, the, the fact that, you know, it's like when you try to solve a puzzle, right? All the pieces have to fit together. And if they're well machined, there's no slack. You cannot try to, let, let's, I just push a little harder here. And it will fit, you know, it has to fit precisely. A well-manufactured puzzle is such that uh, it's just well-machined also. So there is just precision. You just have to get it right. And uh, there is something, you know, satisfying to human beings about being able to, to solve a problem. I mean, we all, when we are, when we solve a nice puzzle, there is a piece of, there is a part of it that says, oh, I did it. I solved it. I was able to do it. And to me, every time you write a program, it's like this. All the pieces have to fit together. And uh, in some sense, when there's more friction, when I remember the process, coding sheets, punch cards, you get one run per day because it goes, you know, the, the, the computer is busy and you, you hand the, the punch cards and you get the, out, the, the, the output the next day. The challenge is more, it's not, oh, well, you know, when I remember when my, when my son started programming and he would just start typing on the Apple IIe. I said, no, 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 you don't start typing. First, you, have a, you take a sheet of paper, you write your program, you think it's true. He said, why? And he was right, okay? Just run it and see what happens. But because the friction was higher, the satisfaction, I think, also was higher on getting things just right. You, you mentioned reasoning a lot. And you also, it, it sounds like we're, we're slowly starting to talk about artificial intelligence, right? Is intelligence and reasoning the same thing? Or do, uh, people often seem to use these synonymously. Uh, do you distinguish them? No, I don't think intelligence and reasoning are the same. You know, it's actually difficult to define intelligence which is why Turing, instead of trying, you know, remember Turing paper was about computational intelligence. That was the, the, the paper he wrote about who was trying to capture. And he couldn't come up with a definition. What is intelligence? It's again, one of these fuzzy, it's a fuzzy term. Okay. Define love, define intelligence. So there is a, from the, it was a, a novel and then a play and a movie, Tevia, uh, Fiddler on the Roof, Fiddler on the Roof. Mm. And at some point, I think his, his wife, he asked his wife, do you love me? And she says, I cook for you. I wash your clothes. She come up with all these things that she does for him. And she said, this is not love. So Turing came up with the same thing. He tried to come up with an operational definition of, of, uh, of intelligence instead of 
a definition. Say, okay, yeah. what is intelligence? Well, when you talk, you sound like a human being, then you must be intelligent. So we say, what is love? We debate it and we try to offer a, an operational definition of what is love. We ask, what is intelligence? Again, we try to come up with an operational definition of intelligence. But what is precisely intelligence? Something we are still debating. What is intelligence? You have cognitive science that kind of try to understand the, what is intelligence? How, how do we, how did nature generate intelligence? How did the brain work? We still don't know. We have, you know, this is something that we keep even debating. One of the things it's become clear, and this is Kahneman made it clear in his book, Fast and Slow Thinking, is that intelligence is, is complex. And because there is a result of evolution here. So there is a part of the brain, the, the big part of the brain, and I'm simplifying, but this is what Kahneman called fast thinking, okay? So recognizing something risky does require some kind of recognition, okay? We need to, you're walking the savannah of Africa, it's a high yellow, it's a high grass, tall grass, you see something yellow moving. You say, this is a lion, I need to get out of here. This is a form of intelligence. Now, it's, in, it's a form of intelligence we share with other animals. They can also recognize patterns. They can, see, they can sense danger. They can react to danger. They escape. They issue some warning. You see, I don't know if you ever watch, uh, what is it? It's this uh, kind of rodent in, in, in Africa, Mano. It's a BBC show. But oh, okay. Some kind of Af African prairie dog. Milkat, Milkat. Oh, okay. Milkat Mano. The BBC has made a whole show. There is someone who is the, the sentry. He has to observe and look for, for uh, birds of prey, for hawks, because they hunt the, the meerkats. So that's a form of intelligence. But we have developed also the forebrain. And that's the part we do, we do kind of reasoning. So we, we know that animals do some form of reasoning. I mean, they can count to some extent. I mean, we've seen that if you show like a pigeon, you know, four seeds, and the pigeon starts eating the seeds, and while she's eating seed number one and two, you hide number three and four. It's clear the pigeon knows there has to be more. There, there was more. There were four here. I only ate two. Where are the other two? Pigeon is sick. Where are the other two? So they can do some forms of reasoning. So we find some notion of numeracy among, among animals. But again, we have taken, we've taken numeracy to, to a level that cannot be seen in the, I don't think any, any species can do multiplication. And even when they do ad addition, it's usually kind of small numbers. I don't think they can do how much is 27 minus 13. And then we took it to, you know, we took it to, you know, if you go, go back, you know, the, you, you find that there is a lion in the savannah and you want, you go back to, you manage to escape alive. And now you go back to, to your village and you want to hunt a lion. You have to form a plan. So again, we're not the only one to form a, some, kind of, some kind of a plan. I mean, you see like hunting animals that hunt in packs. You can almost see the saying, you go there, I will go here. You ambush the, the antelope from, from, from that side. But again, we've taken everything to a higher level and we develop language. So that's kind of slow thinking. And again, there are no sharp boundaries. People debated exactly what is slow thinking, what is, what is hard thinking, where the symbolic intelligence fits in. But if you look at most what machine learning can, does best today, machine learning is really about... I mean, that different type, but part, the big part of it, the big success, initial success was with a pattern recognition, which is, I remember when uh, I was thinking of, uh, when I applied for the PhD program, and I applied for a PhD program in the United States, and I didn't do it very well. I didn't have, I was out of college at that point. I was in, in the mili my military service. I had no one to advise me. So I really was like a klutz applying for graduate school. So I did, I mean, I ended up studying in Israel. But there was a friend of mine who was a bit more experienced and he said, I need to write about area of research. What should I write about? And he said, oh, pattern recognition is a very hot area. And now we are talking about, you know, somewhere circa, you know, 1978. So machine learning has really revolutionized pattern recognition to a degree that we are still, it's a, it's a research question. Why are deep, deep networks so effective? It's an interesting, it's an inter interesting research question. We have made huge progress. I think that uh, I, I, I tell the SAC community, they've made a, a tragic mistake in, this, in describing the, this current generation of SAT solvers, as CDCL solvers. What the hell is CDCL? Who knows what the hell is CDCL? And you say, oh, conflict-driven closed learning. It's even worse mouthful. We should have called it deep solving. 
if we had called it deep solving, everybody would talk about, oh, deep solving. You know, it just whoever called deep learning, deep learning, deep network, deep neural network was a was a was a it's a brilliant was a brilliant marketing move to say, okay, it's different than what it was before, and it's deep. Deep. Deep is a is a good word. There are some words that are good, okay? I would have maybe maybe we should call it we should call it not deep solving, but profound solving. Profound is even deeper than deep. But we've made amazing progress. I mean, progress that was, again, was unimaginable. I mean, by now we are kind of, I said, the SAT revolution was launched roughly in the mid-90s, mid, in the mid 90s, and it's been amazing progress. Now, it does not have the, didn't have the, does not have the flashiness of, of yeah. I can distinguish a, a cats from dog, and I can do tasks that really before only people could do. Because partly we are solving, we are solving problem in automated reasoning that people could never try to do. In terms of the application, when people, you know, start proposing SAT for all kind of practical problem, it was, it was kind of nobody took it seriously. I mean, what do you? It's a complete problem. What do you? You you, you can't really hope to do something serious there. And the fact that today SAT solving part of industrial practice, especially in software development and in software development in in a computer aided design, again, it doesn't have the visibility of what happened in, with deep learning. But I think deep solving is another kind of revolution. And now the, the task is on us to say we have, there have been two revolutions in AI over the past, uh, in, in the 21st century. One was deep solving started in the late 90s. One is deep learning starting was, again, I mean, you can say where it started because neural nets go back to the 1940s, just like SAT solving go back to the 1950s. But there is this phenomenon that you have one idea and then another idea. And then people get excited on some idea and then they get disappointed because the idea didn't quite pan out. And some people get disillusioned and they leave the field, but other people are, have the staying power. And they say, no, 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 we, we, are, we are optimistic. We'll keep, we'll keep going. I remember when I was a, a manager at uh, IBM Research and there was a group there that started by John Bacchus. John Bacchus received the Turing Award for Portan and then he, when he gave it, he was supposed to get uh, to give the Turing Award lecture. And Turing Award, in the Turing Award lecture, he said, Photon is no good. It was the language of the 50s. It's time to move to, to better languages. And he argued that it should be functional languages, functional programming. And the question is how to get the, all the advantage of functional programming, but with the efficiency of Photon. You want to write high-level program in functional programming, but you want it to be as fast as, as Photon. And so he started a research project called FP, for Functional Programming. And he was an IBM fellow. IBM fellow usually reports to the director of the lab. But because he was also a group manager, I was his manager. So I, I'm, I'm blown away. I was the manager of John Bacchus. Okay, John Bacchus was this great computer scientist, and I was his manager. And then he retired, and I had a, a meeting with the, with the group and the manager of computer science at the time. And they described what they are doing. And they said, well, we hope this will be a successful. They talk about hope. And uh, my manager, who was the manager of computer science at, at IBM Alma Denrisha Center, said, hope, hope, what is about hope? I want, I want guarantees that you're going to deliver. And I remember I said, no, research has no guarantees. Research is always about hope. Research <laughs> is always about hope. It's not about the guarantee. Once it's a guarantee, it's not a research project anymore. It's a development project. Because a development project is you know what you need to do, you just need the resources to do it. But research is always about hope. So, you know, we, I said we continue to hope that this progress that we have will get us closer to, to this, again, this fuzzy concept that is not precise, AGI. But the question is how do we now take these two different progresses that exceeded our, our expectations and put them together? Yeah. And that, to me, one of the the great challenges of today. So we, we, we talk about reasoning a lot. We have automated reasoning, which is usually associated with deductive reasoning, right? We have like stat solving or SMP solving, MILP solving, and we also have deep learning, but it seems like it's doing a different kind of reasoning. Usually people describe it as abductive reasoning or philosophical inductive reasoning in both. These are very two fundamentally different forms of reasoning. Right. In deductive reasoning, we have precision. Abductive reasoning, we're trying to do patterns. But me as a person, I do both every single day. 
And you're right. It is hard to combine these two. And if we have general intelligence, right, it needs to be able to do all kinds of reasoning that if, it, if it's truly general with respect to a human, it needs to be able to do all kinds of reasoning a human can do, everything we can theorize. What, what is the difficulty in synergizing these two methods of reasoning? I mean, the brain is, is a complicated organ. The brain is a complicated organ. I mean, think about it. We have brain diseases, such as Alzheimer and Parkinson, that affects many, many millions of people. As the population ages, they are becoming more and more acute. You know, they have huge impact on our society. And we seem to be making very little progress about understanding what's going on. How do we, how do we solve? Okay. So it's a complicated organ. Nature has spent many, many, many millions of years evolving it to what it does. We don't fully understand how it works. And because of its complexity, I mean, what happened in very often in, um, in, you know, with engineering, we discover, okay, how do birds fly? Well, we didn't try to, to we, you know, maybe Icarus tried to imitate birds. But the important thing was the observation, well, there is a physical phenomenon here called lift. When the air flows under something, you have pressure to go, going up, you know, Bernoulli. And then once we had this, when, when it was come to building flying machines, we didn't try to have flapping, flapping wings. We said, no, the key is to have wings with some, en- with some angle against the air and then speed driven by an engine. So we got, we got flying machines. Okay. It's not clear there is a, a simple set of principles that will explain the burning. Okay. There's people talk about complexity theory, not the computational complexity theory, but the theory of complex systems and emergence. And they are not quite seem to be amenable to reductionism. We can't quite find to do this. But, but in some sense, you, you could argue the success of deep learning does come from thinking about the brain. And the observation is that the basic element of the brain is a neuron that fires if other neuron fires. So we have the basic computational element of, an, of a neural net. And if you ask, and this is greatly simplifying, Okay, but you ask, what, what did it take? Why it went from the 40s until I think 43, maybe it was a paper by Pitts and McCullough. So it took about 70 years to suddenly see that this, this actually works. And people have given up on it. I've heard stories about uh, when NeuroIPS was, was still called NIPS around 2000, and there was a reception, and a colleague of mine told me, he's, he remembered Jeff Hinton standing in a corner, and no one talks to him. Because he's the crazy guy that still believes that the neural nets are going to work. Where everyone else at NIPS, NIPS was stood for Neural Information Processing System. Everyone else already given up on neural nets. And this crazy guy is still thinking this is going to work. But, you know, over time, you know, just like what happened with, with, with such solving, just accumulation of enough very clever heuristic. Here we had to have better algorithms, improvement in, in backward propagation algorithms. and more powerful computers. I mean, people underestimated. You know, we think of the brain and we think, okay, the brain does it, I don't know, on, on 10 watt or whatever, 20 watt. So why do we need such big, heavy computer? The answer is right now, that's what we need. We, have, in terms of energy expenditures, where the brain is incredibly efficient, they underestimated the computational effort. And this was true for the, for throughout the history of AI. People underestimated the computational effort of even just, just winning in chess. They said, how hard can chess be? Just, just a mechanical game didn't understand computational effort involved. So the development of computational effort, better algorithms, and big data. What we suddenly had around 2010, which we never had before, is large data sets, which we never had before. Before that, data sets were curated manually. And so it used to be that you take a, that you take a group of graduate students yeah. and they would have to curate the data, okay? <laughs> And then you can talk, oh, okay, but maybe we'll have thousands of images in our, in our database. And then there was mechanical Turk, and you can maybe go to tens of thousands of images. But then the, you know, social media give us a source of images, okay? We are talking now about in the millions of images. So the emergence of all this, suddenly everything, there was a confluence of all these things. And there were people who didn't give up and kept pushing these ideas. And suddenly, poof, it exploded if it was new. But it was not new. It was there before. We just had this magical time where the sweet spot, where suddenly everything that was required to launch the, the, the deep learning revolution just showed up and we had such a revolution. I, can, we, I think we started solving it was a bit slower. There was no, I mean, 
there was a moment there where, where computers can do better on ImageNet and better than, than humans. So this was kind of a, a magical point. And again, start solving or dealing with the task that humans are were never very good at. Humans are never good at uh, mechanical reasoning. You know, part of the question, you have to look at the other forms of reasoning. And you say, okay, what distinguish them from, for example, from, from uh, what we call automated reasoning? And one obvious thing is, as much as it was uh, brilliant to say everything is reducible to bits, it's not necessarily the right abstraction. Hmm. So we can take, for example, you know, people have shown that you can take a probabilistic inference and you can reduce it to model counting. So first of all, even the start you're doing model counting, you have a Boolean formula, how many, how many solutions, how many satisfying assignments does it have? We're already beyond just is it true or false. So yes, then you can say the number, the number of, of satisfying assignments is a number. I can write it in binary, so I'm back to everything is bits. But it may not be necessarily the most effective way of doing things. And what is the probabilistic so, inference problem? Probabilistic inference is we have, a, we, have graphical mo- we have graphical models. And we're trying to reason about, about, a, about probabilities. So we have, a, we have variable with dependence between variables. And so we have a we're reasoning about probabilities. So this is something important. In fact, if you look at the kind of the AI revolution, I would say there are, there are waves. And uh, John McCarthy was a big believer in symbolic reasoning. He said intelligence is all about symbolic reasoning. And so that was kind of the big push. That's what he pushed for, symbolic reasoning, symbolic reasoning. And he realized that it's not exactly classical logic and you need non-monotonic reasoning. And there are frame problems. There are all kind of complicated factors. It's not just simple, just do such solving. Okay. But then I would say that the, the second wave and was kind of early machine learning or Judea Perel, who argues that uh, to reason, to understand the world, you need to understand probabilities and causality. You know, we, we do these estimates all the time. Yeah. For example, you drive your car, I drive my car to work. I know there is a risk, but the risk is relatively small. So I'm, I'm not, I'm not, I may not do it on a piece of paper. But intuitively, I said, no, it's a risk that I'm willing to take. One of the problems for us with COVID has been, we don't know exactly what is the risk. It's an unfamiliar risk. So unfamiliar risk always looks scarier than a familiar risk. And we don't know, okay, how risky is it? Okay, can I take the risk to go to this event or not? And so, so the point is that in the, when we operate in the world, part of intelligence does involve probabilistic thinking. And that's why he pushed for probabilistic thinking. And that also has to do with causality. So, so intelligence, what we're going to discover, intelligence cannot be reduced. It's not just, it's all about airlift. If you do airlift, you can fly, okay? This is much more complicated. And we're uncovering the different pieces of it, and we have to learn how to put them all together. So part of what I'm trying to do this day is to take logic and make it quantitative, such as, how many, it turns out that these questions of uh, counting how many satisfying assignment is step number one in making things quantitative. Okay. Okay. Something, you know, in classical logic, they said something is valid, which means it's always true. And so we have a proof. We can have a resolution proof that it's always true. Or when we do formula, which is unsatisfiable, it's a dual, it is never true. Or it is sometimes true. But in re- in, very often in real life, you want to know, okay, sometimes. I always, when I see, when I see kind of a legal dramas on TV, I always say you have the, the, the defense attorney is a, asking the expert, but is it possible that the bullet did not really kill the victim? And I'm dying, I say, I want to be on the witness stand. And because if the Lord would ask me, is it possible? I would say, please define possible. What does possible mean? It is possible that I'm not really having a conversation with you. This is one, just a dream. I'm just dreaming. It's a very, very vivid well, dream. Okay? It is possible. I cannot have, you know, the brain in a vat thing. It's possible. So I, I would love to ask the question, define to tell the lawyer, define possible. I cannot answer your question before you define possible. So, so far I never got my dream because I'm not an expert witness on shooting. So probably I'll never have the chance to do that. But in real life, it does matter. You know, when some, if we say something is sometimes true, we say, well, how often is it true? And this step of making logic more quantitative, I think it's a very important step in trying to kind of marry what we call automated reasoning with machine learning, which is really an optimization. What are we doing there? We're solving an optimization problem. Okay, so to do that, we first of all, we have to take logic out of the excluded middle ghetto, so to speak. Yes, it was a brilliant idea. 
that we just need true and false, but we need to take it to the next level. So, and that in, include quantitative reasoning, logical quantitative reasoning. And that to me is the kind of one of the important frontier in logic is quantitative reasoning. So it's a great problem. How do we marry these two techniques, these machine learning, abductive techniques, and these automated reasoning techniques, these deductive techniques. Um, but you also mentioned emergence uh, in that last bit. Is it, is it possible that perhaps it just sim- one just simply emerges from the other, right? Like perhaps deductive reasoning is emergent from abductive reasoning, or maybe vice versa, or perhaps neither. Perhaps they're two independent systems internally. Do you have thoughts on that? So, I mean, there are some of the big proponents of machine learning are saying, this is it. There's nothing else. Deep learning, deep learning, deep learning. It will learn everything. Okay, it will learn how to, to do, to solve logical problems. And you find interesting paper that try to take a formula and model it in some, as a graph and use GNN to solve satisfiability. Okay. And they do better than one would have expected. I mean, I, in fact, I wrote a paper some years ago, but using a GNN, graph neural network, to solve some kind of look at it, a traveling salesman problem. And we started writing the paper thinking, this will be, this is never going to work. Let's write a paper showing how it doesn't work. We end up writing a paper saying, ah, it actually works pretty <laughs> well. And we don't fully understand it because if you look at the GNN, they're essentially polynomial time algorithm. So there are some kind of approximate polynomial algorithm, but we don't fully understand what it does. So it's, a, it's another interesting question. So the question is, can automated reasoning emerge from deep learning? Answer is, we don't know yet. This is one of the things that people debate. I'm... I'm kind of, look, in some sense, the brain implements everything as a neural net. The brain implements everything as a neural net. But that to me is not necessarily the right argument because, for example, we know that a computer works with just digital logic. That's how computers work. But if I told you, okay, that's all you need to know, everything you do, use digital logic, design circuits for everything at the digital level, okay? One bit registers. Answer it, it's very, very low level. So in fact, what we have invented, when I uh, teach my course in logic, I have one lecture in which I told students, I'm going to tell you now, the biggest idea in science, the most important idea in science, and they all kind of sit tight in their chair, and I explain to them the tower of abstractions. Because to deal with complex systems, uh, even mathematics, you can think of as a complex system. Yes, we know that set theory is a, maybe is the foundation of it. People, let's, let's, let's not, there's some debate, but let's, the standard view is set theory the found is the proper foundation for math, for mathematics, but when you deal with uh, with uh, with all kind of uh, type of mathematics, you don't really really think in terms of set theory. You have already created the terminology that you use, and yes, we know that we can encode numbers as sets. So the empty sets encode zero, and the set the set containing the empty sets is encodes one. When you do arithmetic, you don't think of the set theoretic encoding. You've created already an abstraction, you operate at a higher level. And that's the way typically we deal with complexity. So we have, uh, first of all, the computer itself. We have, I mean, at the, at the heart of everything is analog physics, mm. okay? There's no digital logic. Digital logic is already an abstraction. So we have learned how to take solid state devices and create the dig- digital abstraction, okay? create things that will always be only, we created the excluded middle. And we have to be clever about how to make sure we, do, we don't get circled with a metastable, metastable state that are between zero and one. No, it should be zero or one. And, and the circle, the physics should drive it to zero or one by, by feedback loops. We've learned how to do that. But now we're not, you know, I mean, there's a story. Early days, people wrote program was in binary. And then high level language was octal, was a great idea. We can do it all in octal. And then for Norman is at the Institute for Advanced Studies at Princeton. And one of his students come up with a brilliant idea of the assembler, mm. of a symbolic language. For, instead of using machine language, you have mnemonics for the, for the opcodes and you have symbolic name for the registers. So that's how we got assembler. And he's very proud of himself. And uh, he goes to von Neumann to show him his invention. He wrote, he wrote the first assembler. And von Neumann, who could multiply eight-digit numbers in his head, was completely dismissive. And he said, you're wasting precious computer time for clerical problems that humans can do. So computing by listing tables was, was clearly, computers made human mm-hmm. progress. 
But the, the whole point of computer, computer pro- programmer productivity, completely for Norman, completely did not see the point. In fact, John Bacchus told me a story uh, how in the early 50s, they are developing the Fort- Fortran compiler at IBM Research in, uh, in uh, Yorktown Heights. And for Norman comes to visit. For Norman at this point, it's like God descending to God is coming to do code review. I mean, he just like, he was just, uh, the, you couldn't imagine anybody was a higher stature. And they very proudly tell him about Fortran and the compiler. And he look completely underwhelmed. And when the presentation is over, he asks, why are you doing it? Why are you doing it? And they said, well, programming is difficult. And for Norman says, ah, nonsense. If it's difficult for you, just give it to graduate students to do. Okay. Just give it to graduate students. So how do things emerge? This is something we don't really fully understand. How you take all these different pieces and, and put them together and out of this comes intelligence. We don't know. We, we've talked about abstractions a lot, but in the context, usually a human is the one making the abstraction here. You, if you go to a, like a machine learning competition site like Kegel, uh, some of the more difficult problems are when they try to get a machine learning agent to learn like an abstract concept and see if it generalizes. But this is very hard. Deductive reasoning, it's, it's, it's hard to come up with an abstraction to do deductive reasoning on. Machine learning, you think it might be able to find abstractions when it learns, but if it doesn't generalize the new data sets, it's very easy to become skeptical of this. What, what is it so, why is it so hard to compute abstractions? The thing that blew me away was the concept of energy. Because uh, speed, we understand speed. This car goes much faster than the other one. We understand acceleration. Push the gas, you accelerate, you push it more, accelerate farther. These are all very intuitive in our basic intuition, physical in- intuition of the world. We understand this concept. Momentum. Well, being hit by, uh, if somebody hits you, if it's a, same speed, but if it's a small fist versus a big fist, you understand the difference, yeah. okay? So momentum, again, has clear physical intuition. Energy does not. What is energy? The capacity to do work. What the hell does it mean? So we end up hmm. having, okay, it, we show and we kind of, after a while, the beginning, I was very puzzled by the concept of energy. And after a while, I can't claim that I understand it better. I just got used to it. And today we use the word energy kind of freely, okay? But it's a very mysterious concept, and it's an abstract concept that physicists, physicists have invented, and it does not, I claim it does not have a clear physical intuition, and they, have, they had to show it's a very useful concept, and it was so useful that now we talk about it as if it is very clear what it is, storing energy and transmitting energy and all these kind of things. And what is the capacity to do work? And does not really have a kind of a, Natural, you don't feel it. It's not something you sense in your natural senses in the world. How did they come up with this? So I remember hearing a talk many years ago in a conference KR, was invited talk at least 20 years ago. How does the brain come up with new abstractions and elaborate theory? End of the talk, questions, I raised my hand. And I said, do you have any evidence that this is how the brain works? And then I suddenly thought, I said, excuse me, let me rephrase my question. Is this, is your theory of how the brain form abstraction? I didn't remember the Popperian, Popperian uh, test. Is it fal- falsifiable? I said, what experiment would you run to try to falsify this theory of yours? And he thought, he thought he stood there quietly and thought for a minute and he said, he said, I can't think of any. And you could kind of hear the gasp in the audience because it means it's a nice story, but what is it beyond a nice story? I was perhaps a little, a little harsh because there are two things about scientific theories. One is, are they refutable? But think of the heliocentric model, okay? We understand now that the, the Ptolemaic model was a model that allowed you to compute the motions of the planet. It was a complicated model. You can't really say that, uh, that the heliocentric model is truer. There's no experiment. I mean, they had an elaborate enough model that there's no experiment that would distinguish the heliocentric model from the Ptolemaic model, because they did, they, they had at that point 2,000 years of, of learning how to compute with the elaboration of Ptolemaic model and how to compute the motions of the planet. The power of the heliocentric model was, oh, it's a very simple model to explain things. And it needs some refinement. We went from, from circular 
trajectories to, to elliptical trajectories to get the precision. In fact, at the, at the beginning, the heliocentric model was less precise than the Ptolemaic model. And so, uh, in fact, something that deep learning goes against, statisticians develop something called minimum description lens. Between different models, you should go after the one that has makes the smallest number of assumptions, has the sim- simple description, which is also called Occam's razor. And in it, people say, suppose we had machine learning to do science. We will never come up with the heliocentric model because we will just feed all the, all the astronomical data to some deep, deep learning system. It will optimize, you know, billion parameters. It will give us wonderful predictions about what the planets are going to be. So we'll never have the heliocentric model. So what the heliocentric model offers us is, is the power of the abstraction is, is a mental tool, okay? And does energy exist? Well, in what sense does it exist, okay? I mean, we go to, to the question, what does, it, what does it mean to exist? But energy has proven to be incredibly useful abstraction for physical reasoning. No. So it, it, we made it to exist as if any other physical quantity it exists. But we had to refine our notion, what does it mean to exist? It's not something you can sense. You cannot sense energy direct. So there might be similar issues that we, which can create abstraction for intelligence. And there may be the way the brain works, or there may, there may be the brain that it, it helps us to build artificial, artificial intelligence systems. Because we're not going to be able to imitate fully, to fully imitate the brain. I mean, this is still, the brain is a, is a magic of, of bio, biological engineering. In, I believe it was the 1500s, when they were trying to solve the cubic equation, there, there's a science communicator, Veritas Steam, has a great video on this. But when trying to work out the cubic equation, they uh, ended up coming up with imaginary numbers. And this was a very controversial thing. Why do we need these imaginary numbers to make mathematics work? But several years later, we found quantum mechanics and quantum mechanics show that imaginary numbers might exist. So my question is, is math invented or is it discovered? And what is the relationship with logic and reality? There, there is, there's clearly something. Oftentimes we, we find these mathematical or logical constructs before we, fi- before we find them in reality itself. Logic seems to be predictive of reality. Well, why is there this relationship? Can you speak to both? So this is one of the, I would say, the fundamental question in the philosophy of mathematics. Is mathematics discovered or invented? Is it a human invention or is it already out there in nature? Okay. And my view is that what does it mean it's out there in nature? Okay. Everything that we say is out there in nature, first of all, is pushed through our brains, okay? You know, I'm, I'm talking to you, and I think, of you as, I think of you as a unitary phenomenon, okay, Joe Scott. Well, Joe Scott is a cloud of, of molecules and electrons and, and what have you, okay? But I have decided to do object, we've done object-oriented programming for, from, from way back. We decided to encapsulate this cloud of particles we don't sense it as a cloud of particles. Our brain uh, gives us a picture and we interpret it as a person. Okay. Think of, you know, think of, we have, we know all, we have on our, uh, in our skin, we have a, sometimes not just bacteria, but tiny insect. People don't know that, but a tiny insect that, that lives on our skin. Okay. Pretty disgusting. So most people prefer not to think about it. But this, this, do these tiny insects, Think of, of you as Joe Scott or as a collection of, of skin, skin, uh, skin cells that they can eat, dead skin cells, they eat dead skin cells, okay? They don't think of Joe Scott, the person. So this question, the word exists, it's just a very, very complicated. There's, I'm, and I'm not, you know, I'm, I'm sure you can go to the philosophy department and find, you know, ontologists and they can tell you, but what does it mean to exist? To, to exist is something we said, Oh, this is clearly here. I mean, there, 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 are, there are things. That, why? Because we need to, to need, we need to survive in a physical world. Okay. So the whole concept, even, you know, there is a, I start when I teach logic, I start with the question, what is logic? And, uh, and people think logic is about reasoning. And I said, no, no, reasoning is means. Logic is the search for truth. We want, we want to know what is true. And when we talk about what is true, we have, first of all, the level of, uh, of Wittgenstein, the world is just a set of facts. Is this, is this particle here or is it not here? Is it moving or is it not moving? 
okay? But because we have language, we talk about more complicated things, okay? She loves me, she doesn't, she loves me not. It's a more complicated phenomenon, okay? Is it, how objective is it? Is there a clear answer to that question, okay? So the, we see the world, or we, we see, you know, this is the whole part of questions that, is there an objective reality out there? I believe there is an objective reality. We live in some objective reality. But what we see as objective reality is never objective. It is always subject to how we sense it and how we process these images. And this is part of the debate is, you know, is it people argue about uh, the way we're sensing is a, is a social construct. And I don't, I, I suspect that even a person who is, does not live in a society has to process certain things. But we never, you know, a, a child can never go without some society. You have, there is a story about uh, wolf children who were raised by wolves, okay? They have been raised in a society of wolves, so they have learned to interpret the world the way wolves interpret the world. So I, I don't have clear answer to what does it mean to exist? And I say, what does, does energy exist? Do electrons exist? And now we get to, do numbers exist? What does it mean for numbers to exist? And the answer is to me, numbers are an abstraction, okay? So to say, you know, we, we realize that the two apples and two oranges, they have something in common. The two-ness is something they have in common. So we came up with the concept of two. Does two exist? I don't know how to answer that question. Does two exist? But it's a very, very useful abstraction to talk about two. And then we have two and three. These are different abstractions. So we have two and three, and we made another abstraction. The abstraction was a number. Both two and three are numbers. So when it comes to does math, is mathematics discovered or is mathematics invented, I don't have a, a very, very sharp answer to that. But my intuition is that numbers, we have created an abstraction, so we invented numbers. We talk about in the perspective of math, right? Like is math invented or is math uh, discovered? But logic is sort of meta-mathematics, right? Um, do, do you have any insights from like a logical lens instead of a more mathematical lens on this question? So I think kind of, you know, logic is, is, I would say is again, is logic, is logic discovered or invented? And the answer is that we have concept of tools that are very crisp. You come and you punch me on the face and now I'm hurting. I'm hurting. And somebody said, no, 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 you're not hurting. It's all your imagination. I said, no, I'm hurting. Joe punched me in the face. I'm hurting. This is, this is painful. Okay. This is reality for me. This is very, very real. And if you tell me your brain in a vat, I say, it doesn't matter. I feel the pain. So, you know, Pontius Pilate asked the question, what is truth? And that's kind of a philosophical question. What is truth? We don't have a, a very, very clear answer. What is truth? But we have a innate sense that on, on certain things, you know, when I, when I stood there in front of the class and I teach my class in logic, and I said, am I standing in front of you? Everybody says, yes. There's no debate about it. Am I a great teacher? Yeah, that's a matter of debate now. But just to say, are you standing in front of us? Yes. So, so the fact that there are certain, certain things are facts, okay, and they are true, and that would lead to the abstraction of, we have created an abstraction. True and false are abstractions. And now we are talking about the facts and what is abstract. And in that sense, true and false are abstractions that we've created. We've created abstractions. So, the basis of logic, is it discovered or invented? I think, you know, to me, it's kind of the same way that we, we invented language. We created the concept of true and false. Yes, we have a concept of what is a fact and what is not a fact, but the concept, the Chris concept, nice, very clear, true, false. It's the same way we, we do, it's part of the inventing language. Every language, I think, has a concept, of, this is true, this is not true, you are lying. You, you took, I left, the, I left the, the apple here, you took my apple, you were saying no, you're lying. These concepts are very, very basic to humans. So the true and false exist without, you know, fact seems to have an objective, objective existence, I believe. Okay, certain fact, this particle is here or not. But to talk about the truth or falsity of the statement that require humans say this is true, this is false. Doesn't make any sense without it. Without it, you have naked facts, but there's nothing false unless somebody says, this is true, this is false. So in my view is same we invented language, we invented a, a, a logical a framework to talk about the world. Numbers are kind of, you know, again, Kornecker said that God gave us the numbers, everything else is human invention. 
I think that two apples and two oranges are from nature, but recognizing that there are the same number of apples and oranges, that's, that somebody had to recognize the same number, it takes some form of intelligence, not necessarily human or, I said, other animals. But to say, not only that, to say that two-ness and three-ness and four-ness have something in common, that clearly is part of human capacity to invent abstractions, and that's a human invention. We talk about true and false. Well, in reality, and again, an included middle, abstract truths and abstract false, and nothing in the middle, it's a human invention because, because in the real world, there is almost very rarely do you have sharp truths and sharp faults. It's the almost degrees of truths, there are nuance. So this sharp concept, I think this is to me the human invention. Changing gears a little bit. Um, during the pandemic, I've studied history a little bit. I've watched a lot of YouTube on history. One thing that really stuck with me was how relative for the times, style of life from like the 1200s to the 1800s, it was fairly consistent. There was some changes, but they were minor compared to the grand scheme of things. And then we have the industrial revolution and everything changed. And there was a lot of hiccups when we, when there was a, that transfer from to the industrial revolution. And nowadays it, it seems familiar, right? We're going through a bit of a technological revolution. What are your thoughts on the should we be afraid of this upcoming revolution? Can we learn from the past? How can we prepare for this? Now you hear people complaining, let's say, the, 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 the writer, the poster boy for complaints in technologies about social media, for example. And people very often respond, oh, yeah, but uh, uh, Socrates objected to writing. He thought that the oral tradition was better than the, than the written tradition. And so the human story, in my opinion, if you look at the human story, kind of what people call big history, like Yuval Noah Harari, kind of big history, the, big, the, the human story is the story of technology. Okay? We have discovered technology, the, the fire. What did we discover? We didn't invent fire. We discovered that we can use fire. We can use fire, you know, we can use natural fire to stick the, 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 the antelope thigh in the, uh, thigh in the fire and it tastes better. It's easier to chew if it, is, if it is roasted. So we discover fire. That was the first technological tool. And then we discover we created other tools. Now we discover we can throw stones. Then we can make axes. And, we, we, and each such invention, we, if, even technology we invented, it changed us. Okay, for example, mm-hmm. one clear about the difference between us and Homo, homo Neanderthal, they had huge jaws. Why did they have huge jaws? Because they need to chew raw food. I think gorillas spend several hours a day just chewing the food. And we have these nice puny jaws because we, we, the food is cooked. So, you know, there have been debate. What is paleo? Somehow people think we should go back in a diet to the natural diet of human beings. There was a debate. Are human by nature vegetarian or, or they eat everything? And the real answer that convinced me is human by nature eat cooked food. Some people who argue that we need to go back to raw food. There is one of the movements in it's a bit of a fringe movement. There are people who say, no, no, we should only consume raw food. These people have to spend a lot of time chewing. And the answer is, we've evolved now, over a million years probably, to eat cooked food. So technology changes us. This is the story of technology. We discover technology changes us. When the changes is very fast, we have a hard time with it. All of us have a very, very hard time with, with, uh, with change, okay? If I tell you, well, you do a PhD in automated reasoning. Well, the funding for this has been scratched. You need to do research in, um, in computer animation. And I tell you, um, okay, I understand that you need to, you can throw away, ignore all the papers you wrote, but I'll give you one month to become an expert in, in, uh, in computer animation. You say one month. I spent now years developing my, my skills in automated reasoning. I can in one month suddenly become an expert in, in computer animation. So fast change is difficult for us. Slow change is also difficult, but at least step by step, we can do this. When technology changes very fast, it's caused a tremendous amount of dislocation. People say, for example, you know, I, I, I give talks on automation and its impact on labor. And very often the answer is, well, you know, okay, but the, the, this is all the industrial revolution happened. We all used to work on a farm and we moved to factories. So the industrial revolution happened and we came out okay. This is the answer. We came out okay. The answer is, yes, we came out okay. But it was not an easy adaptation. 
it took many, many years. You know, the industrial revolution, you kind of go back around 1870 and society has kind of fully adapted to, to industrialization. I would say it was post-World War II, was the emergence of the modern social welfare state that we've kind of said, okay, this is how we adjust. We said child labor is not okay. And uh, we used to work like 80 hours a week. Now we only work 40 hours a week. We just made all kind of changes, societal changes, socioeconomic changes, socioeconomic political changes. And partly they were made by people because people realized, in fact, there is, there is a, what they said, one of the most striking data is, there is data about the height of British soldiers. You know, when they, when, when they get uh, drafted, the height is measured. And people did a comparison between maybe uh, 1860 and 1880. What you saw, the British soldiers became shorter. Why do British soldiers become shorter? Because for working class people, things became worse. And they ate less well, nutrition was worse. And so they became shorter. And there was a lot of social reforms in the United Kingdom Partly, I mean, for example, you saw, they saw that what happened in, Soviet, in Russia, in the Soviet Union, we don't want a revolution. We have to make life a little easier for the working class people. So the rich people says, we have to make it a little easier for the working class people. And so society has adapted, and I would say adapting the industrial revolution took 75 years. Now the computer revolution, and we're thinking about the computer revolution, we're thinking about deep learning. No, the real, the real, Revolution is already happening. I mean, the place where you see the analog of what happened in the industrial revolution so far has been mostly what happened to manufacturing. Mm. Because especially in the United States, but also in other countries, manufacturing was people who went to work for manufacturing, typically people without college education. They just, they were trained on the job. So these were high school graduates went to work in manufacturing. And these jobs are usually union jobs and they pay 20 to $30 an hour, which means 40 to $60,000 a year. So there is a story of emerged just recently, and it's called, it's the, the Homer Simpson paradigm. Homer Simpson so paradigm. the show started in 1989, and Homer Simpson is a classical working class man. He is a nuclear, he's a safety inspector on a nuclear plant, he's a high school graduate, has no college education, his wife doesn't work, but the show is about the show is from a middle-class family. They have a house, rich children, can afford to have beer, lots of beer. So middle-class life. Middle, they, they, this working-class family lives middle-class life on one income. And people ask today, what happens today? And today it's an anachronism. Okay? Many, many of these jobs have been eliminated by automation. The automation does not have to be fancy smunchy, Okay? Oh. Deep learning thing. It's plain old automation. And go and uh, go to YouTube and, and, and put Tesla factory. And you see beautifully automated Tesla factory. There's no, no manufacturing workers. It's all done by industrial robots. Industrial robots, basically, you write a program for the robot. It's kind of basic, basic automation. But many, many millions of jobs had been lost. At some point, 25% of, uh, of manufacturing jobs in the United States were 20% of the job were in manufacturing, and now it's below 10%. So millions, millions of jobs have been eliminated. And kind of the question is, okay, what happens with these jobs? The answer is many of the jobs have just, have just disappeared. Have just disappeared now. So it's a fast change. It's very, very difficult for people to adapt quickly. We are not very good at changing quickly. So there was a book came up, I think it was 70. It was, I think it was called Future Shock. And things are changing very fast now and we are not adapting well. And we have yet to accept that things are changing fast, that we need to make some changes. And we have not, you know, we have the iPhone was, I think maybe 2006. And we gave it to our kids. And we, we barely understand what does it do to our kids. Now we talk about the the mental health crisis among American kids and what is causing it. You know, people are debating. It's the phones are, is very often mentioned as a reason. And the more complicated reason, one is, is a social media that has its own 
problems, but also not only the people are sleeping less, apparently the, the teens are sleep deprived. And one of the reasons they're sleep deprived is because it's, you know, the, the iPhones, the, the, the smartphones are addictive, practically. Difficult changes happen very fast and we are, we're not very good at adapting quickly. It's really interesting. Yeah. Your, your Neanderthal example about how we evolve with respect to a given technology, but even in like the industrial revolution and now the technology comes so fast, right? We, we don't have that same time. Evolution is a, is a slow process. On this note, technology, it doesn't seem like it's going to be slowing down anytime soon, right? Like it seems like it's just going to keep going faster and faster and faster. What futuristic technologies that appear to be coming are you the most excited for? And which ones are you the most fearful of with its regard? For example, like AI applications to government and law. What, what scares me is not, is not the technology. What scares me is, is this, the socio-economic political setup in which technology happens. So 1981 is a, I think, crucial year in American history. Three important things happened in 1981. Number one, I arrived in this country. <laughs> This is the joke. But two serious things is Ronald Reagan was elected president, was became president, elected in 1980, became president on January 20 of 1981. And IBM introduced the PC in 1981. Mm -hmm. And personal computer existed before, but the PC made it into, you know, it became first of all a standard business machine. Businesses, you know, it was what IBM had in, in the early years. IBM, it was a, a great business for IBM, the, the IBM PC. Before it became a commodity, and then IBM couldn't quite handle the commodity to, when it became commoditized. But but first, it was a huge, it was a huge success for IBM, and then it became also a household tool. Everybody had computer at home, and in parallel, we had a development that started also in the in the seventies, which was ARPANET. But now you had the computer everywhere to connect to that. Before that, you didn't have everyone will have a home and they connect to it, and all of this happened. All this development of technology happened in an area of neoliberalism in which people say, well, we can leave everything to the markets. We should not regulate. Market will solve everything. And ideology, uh, an ideology has developed called market, you know, less fair economics, neoliberalism, which some people, and I'm with them, call it market fundamentalism. Because be this belief that the market solves everything in the best way and government should not be involved, it's there's no economic theory that tells you that. It's, it's, a, it's a political statement. And in fact, if you think what very often what we know about economics, economic is there has to be, it's a set of, you know, the free market is not, the word free market is very misleading because it sounds as if natural construct, God, God gave us the free market. But the free market is, is a set of rules, okay? For example, I, I, I go to the bank and I buy, they give me a loan to, to buy my house. I'm falling behind behind my, the payments to my house. The banks wants to to foreclose the the on the loan. They want to take my house back. How are they going to do it? Well, in uh, in you know older times, they would bring me some hoodlums to kick me out of the house. So the state, the sheriff, will come and evict me out of my house. The state is viewed in a free market. The state enforcing targets. The very fundamental of what is the market which is we sign contracts, the enforcement of the contract is up to, this, up to the state, government. So this idea the free market exists in some government-free space is just a total illusion. It's not true. And so the question is what we have done for the, for the free market, we've written a set of rules on how it behaves, how, how can you behave, what, what is the free market? It, I said the free market, is just, like, just like deep learning was a marketing term, because the network had to be deep, and deep solving is a missed opportunity. But free market is a marketing term. It's a market. It's a mechanism. And economists talk about mechanism design. What a good mechanism! And one of the, it's a very complicated mechanism. And for it makes sense to modify it once in a while. And for example, one of the big things people discover once you have launched kind of capital, industrial capitalism in the 19th century, we discover that corporations don't like competition. Competition is very nice in theory. But it's bad for business. So within 20 years after Alexander and Graham Bell invented the phone, there were, I think, 6,000 telephone companies in the United States. 20 years later, there was one, AT&T, 
which some people call TPC, the phone company. So how did it happen? Well, they start buying other companies. Whoever was successful bought more companies. Eventually, there was one. Similar thing was tried to do with energy. And so you go, they came up with the concept of antitrust and trust busting. And you go back 100 years ago in Theodore Roosevelt, and that's what the fight was about. And discovered the corporation become, become too powerful and they become monopolistic and you have to bust them. But part of what happened in the neoliberal era is that the government seemed to have lost confidence and, and lost the energy to do trust busting. There was one attempt, which was Microsoft in the 90s. It was nominally, it was a failure because the government, the, the, the trial judge made some mistake and the, and the verdict was turned on, was, was, uh, was evacuated on appeal. But Microsoft did behave better after that. In particular, it did not buy Google when it could have. Mm-hmm. We wouldn't have, we w- and Google and other companies said, oh, okay, we have to be a bit careful. Okay. But Google and, and Facebook have gone on a, on a buying spree. And nobody challenged it. So, so you have Facebook, which own Instagram. And they bought Instagram because, you know, they wanted to, it was competition. Consolidate. Consolidate. And then they bought WhatsApp, which was another kind of, it was competition, was another social network. And we just let them do that. And so what we have today, I'm afraid of technology that is driven by corporations who are driven just by the profit motive. So Sheryl Sandberg just announced that she's stepping down for Meta. And so many people, you know, she was a very prominent uh, executive in tech, female executive in tech industry. She's a much more sympathetic character than, than Mark Zuckerberg. She has lost her husband. It was very tragic. So it's very easy to feel sympathy for her. So some people treat her as a fem- feminist hero. I think of her as a feminist villain. She is the master behind Facebook advertising machine. And before that, she was the... She has developed the Google advertising machines. And it's very clear that one reason that these companies are hurting us is because of the dependence on advertising, which means that they want us to keep being engaged, 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 engaged machine. The longer we spend, the more time we spend on it, the better for them. So I'm afraid of technology that is, that is deployed with driven just by the profit mo- motive or with no regulation. So there are corporations now that are selling you you know, automated decision systems to make decision in the judicial arena, make decision on bail, make decision on sentencing. These are difficult decisions. They're difficult for judges to make them. On TV, they always look like easy decision. But judges agonize on some of these decisions. Why not let machines do that? But there are no rules. There are no regulation. There's no auditing. There's no, you know, bias. what about bias? We know that these systems have bias. Should, should they be audited for bias? Well, there are no regulations. So the thing that scares me is not technology per se. It's technology that's being developed and deployed by corporations who are driven by the profit motive, no consideration of societal benefit, and no regulation. That's what scares me. So we have, it sounds almost like the surveillance capitalistic uh, dystopia. There's this famous story about how Google knew a young girl was pregnant before she did or her family did. And it, it, is, it is terrifying. Do, my last question will be, do we have any chance to avoid this? So, you know, the interesting is in the topic you hear now in the news, because of the tightening of abortion regulation in the United States, abortion laws in the United States, and making it illegal for providers to help, help women with abortion, people are realizing the data brokers know when you're pregnant for many, many reasons, okay? They don't want you're pregnant because uh, maybe you have a period tracking app on your phone and they can see maybe what you're buying. There are many ways to infer that people, that someone is pregnant and suddenly you're not pregnant. Who have access to this information? And we all have basically, you know, it was very funny when people, one of the, of the conspiracy theories about uh, the COVID vaccines is, Conspiracy, but Bill Gates has uh, has conspired to inject you with with a surveillance chip. Yes, this is not really what the, what the yes. vaccine is doing, in- injecting you with a chip. The answer is we're all carrying a big chip in our pocket, a surveillance chip in our pocket. Who has access to this data? We have no idea who has access to this data. Can we change it? I think that that 
partly it has to be up to computing professionals, okay? We have to stand up and say, that's not what we sign up for. I look now at my career in computing. It started with a six-year-old, six-year-old who loved the precision and the rules of computing as opposed to the mystery of human relationships. And I look now where we bought the world. And I said, oh my God, I'm responsible to this too. I didn't introduce the product, but I'm part of the generation that thought technology is good and more technology is better and most technology is best. And now we're seeing the harmful effects of these technologies. And when, when our students will stand up and say, working for Meta? No way. They, they should think of working for Meta as working to work for a tobacco company. Okay? Technology that, that, that harms people. You know, still, it's very attractive. People get an offer from Google. Ooh, I got an offer from Google. I'm going to be a Googler. When our students will say, no, I want to do computing, that in a big sense, yeah, of course, I want to have a good career. I want to make money. Companies should make money. But they shouldn't do it by harming people. And today, we're getting closer and closer to the point that these companies should be viewed as the tobacco companies of today. And when we change, we in, in academia start thinking of them this way. And the students saying it's unacceptable to go work for such companies. I'm hoping that that will force change. But we cannot sit there idly engaging in business as usual and hoping that somehow society will figure out a way to stop this damage to society. 